They announce Eric Kaplan, who will read and present Heidegger the Fox. That's right. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ian. Thanks, Mark, for inviting me to this. And thank you all for listening. Um, so in her 1953 essay, Heidegger the Fox, uh, Hannah Arendt tells a fable about Martin Heidegger that offers a left-handed compliment to his power as a thinker. And she credits him simultaneously with unsurpassed knowledge and extreme ignorance. So Heidegger, on Arndt's account, is ignorant on two major fronts. He's ignorant about his subject matter, and he's ignorant about himself. So in this talk, um, I will discuss first uh, Arendt's claim that Heidegger is ignorant about his subject matter, and then her claim that he's ignorant about himself. And then I'll conclude with a discussion of how we should evaluate this dispute between Arendt and Heidegger on the topics that they discuss, uh, including the topic of Heidegger and Arendt's own work and what we ought to get out of them in their dispute. So the first part is um, Heidegger's ignorance of the trap burrow distinction. So the first section then is Arendt's criticism of Heidegger's mistakes on his subject matter. Arendt or argues that Heidegger does not understand the difference between a trap and a burrow, that he displays, quote, shocking ignorance of the difference between traps and non-traps, mm -hmm. and that his ignorance caused him to mistake his own trap for a burrow. Um, so Heidegger was a thinker. So if Heidegger is trapped or he traps others, he does so by his thinking. So Arendt's claim is twofold. First, that for Heidegger, his thinking is something that can be dwelled in. And this is a plausible claim, because in building dwelling thinking, Heidegger argues that we need to understand that both building and thinking, quote, belong to dwelling. And further, he argues that this activity, which involves both building and thinking, is the only solution, quote, to man's homelessness. As soon as man gives thought to his homelessness, it is a misery no longer. So Arendt's thesis is that thinking for Heidegger is in the service of dwelling, and that properly conducted thinking allows us to create a dwelling. What remains for Arendt to do is to establish to, what remains for Arendt to do is to establish her thesis that Heidegger confuses dwelling and being trapped, uh, and she thus has to argue that Heidegger's thinking is a trap. Um, so what would it mean for thinking to be a trap? Um, so going back to Plato's cave, the features are of a trap or that it impedes our freedom and it's worse than someplace else we could get to if we were free. But that could make you wonder how could thinking be a trap? Because isn't thinking what you need to get out of a trap? Don't you think, hey, I'm in a trap and what's the way out of this trap? Isn't that necessary when you want to get out of a trap? So a couple of cases that I think can get us to be sympathetic to the notion that thinking can be a trap. Um, consider the case of a character I'll call Tempest Fugit Tim. So Tempest Fugit Tim is constantly obsessed with how time is fleeing, fleeting. So his first thought, this guy Tim, upon waking up is, I hope I do not waste this day. I will have so few of them. And when he sits down to breakfast, he's tormented by the reflection that he could be doing something more worthwhile with the moment than eating his scrambled eggs. And poor Tempest Fugit Tim's last thought upon going to sleep every day is, that might have been my last day. I'm so sorry I did not spend it better. So Tim is trapped by the thought life is fleeting. And, and a paradoxical thing about the trap that Tim is in is that the way out of Tim's trap is not more thinking. That more thinking could simply constitute another operation of the trap. If we did tell him that he's becoming both miserable and really horrible to be around, he might take our criticism to heart and reflect that wasting his limited time on earth, worrying about his limited time on earth, 
is itself a waste of his limited time on earth. For Tim, the way out of that particular prison of thought could be getting in touch with how awful it feels to live that way. It feels constrained, it feels harried. And that getting in touch need not be, and often isn't, a cognitive process. It's a feeling uh, shared by animals, I think, of unwellness. This way of living just doesn't feel good. Um, if Tim is lucky enough to get a break from it, perhaps for a moment at breakfast he stops worrying and just appreciates a ray of sunlight falling on his face, his hands, and his scrambled eggs. Mm -hmm. That break is not a form of thinking either. The break is a sudden eruption of feeling well. Um, now, there could be multi-person thought traps as well. Um, there's a writer who I like, I guess he's a journalist uh, named Douglas Rushkoff. And he is an example of a man who's trapped by what he calls the billionaire mindset. So I'm gonna call him billionaire mindset Melvin. So Melvin, who statistically is unlikely to be a billionaire, although statistically very likely indeed to fantasize about being one, likes to think of how he will make it in an apocalypse. He imagines he will weather climate collapse and the mega death of billions of humans in fine style in an air-conditioned mansion with an infinity pool protected by his security team of former Navy SEALs. And he does not consider the question, why will the Navy SEALs protect him in an apocalypse when he has nothing to pay them with? Um, so why does Mel fail to consider this question? The billionaire mindset encourages him to view human life as a series of economic problems to be solved by cleverness. And when confronted with the worry, why will your employees care about you when your money is worthless, his mindset leads him to come up with more savage and ridiculous solutions. Um, maybe they'll wear shock collars, to which only I have the key code. Um, and he does not consider that his, the relationship, his relationship with people and his employee is one of reciprocal care. So Melvin is trapped by his mind, by his way of thinking. And like Tim, when he tries to think his way out of it, his way of thinking may well continue to trap him. So Arendt is arguing that Heidegger's mode of thinking traps him in the sense that my two characters are trapped. We can notice from these examples that being aware of the danger of being trapped by your mode of thinking is no guarantee of escaping the trap. In fact, as in the finger trap, uh, which traps you tighter the more you try to escape it, being trapped by thoughts, at least the ones we're considering, can be made even worse uh, by awareness of them. And in this, we can analogize being trapped by thought to being trapped by certain kinds of action. For example, suppose we're engaged in activities that contribute to the climate crisis. Activities that attempt to alleviate the climate crisis, such as having conferences and writing papers, also have a carbon footprint. So the path from a situation where we are exacerbating the climate crisis to one where we are alleviating the climate crisis isn't obvious. It could be that the only way to get to a higher peak of goodness is to climb down from the local maximum that we are stuck at. Similarly, if we're thinking too much, the step to thinking less might be to have the thought, I'm thinking too much. Uh, the fact that from the inside, we can't diagnose where a particular thought will alleviate our overthinking, uh, sorry, whether a particular thought will alleviate our overthinking or add fuel to the fire is part of what makes overthinking a trap. So what aspects of Heidegger's thought might be a trap on this account? Now, first of all, you could consider whether Heidegger traps himself and others with his cottage core aesthetic and nostalgia for ways of yore. Now, if we take these literally, we could argue that Heidegger's model of dwelling is a trap in some pretty straightforward ways, because he doesn't say much or anything, as far as I know, about the, the way in which these ways of life were inherently unsta unstable. And he makes it seem, again taken literally, that we could just stand down from the modernizing forces that caused and are continuing to cause those ways of life and the practices associated with them to disappear. We could also note that imagining a simpler lifestyle in a cottage in a forest is ignoring important questions. Who got to decide who lived in the cottage? What about refugees and ethnic groups of lower status who were physically present but were not, not permitted legally to dwell in these communities? Um, they were people who were literally trapped in these societies, in other words. And if we imagine that, we need to imagine that those people could have been us. Uh, 
uh, the nostalgia traps us in a world we don't want and can't get out of. If we take Heidegger literally then, we'll also find we lack resources for changing the traditional way of living if we find it to be an intolerable trap. In his discussion of the fourfold, he avoids the idea that the godlike ones expect anything from us as far as our treatment of one another, or that we can be godlike to each other when we love and save, that we could be angry at the godlike ones, or we could forgive them or ask them to forgive us. None of the relationships with the divine that could impel a society to change its actual problems, for example, some groups are getting excluded from having literal houses, are present in Heidegger's account of the godlike ones in this essay. Also, his account of language doesn't let us know how we could use it to get out of an intolerable social situation. Taken literally, he depicts it as our responsibility to listen to the message already in the language and not our responsibility to use language to forgive and welcome and include. Now, this is all to say if we took Heidegger, li Heidegger literally and thought he was calling for a return to life where we dwelled happily in low-tech cottages, he'd clearly be in some sort of trap. He'd be advocating a form of life with problems and not giving us any tools for addressing them. No way to get from the dead end of trying to live in a cottage in post-war Germany to someplace better. But this would obviously be a banalization of Heidegger's view in this essay, and we wouldn't expect a thinker as savvy as Arendt to waste your time on him uh, or to say, as she does, that he understood traps better than anyone else. However, there is a philosophical move that Heidegger makes which does constitute the trappiness of his thinking. And this is making a sharp distinction between actual problems and philosophical ones, between the ontic and the ontological. Heidegger can be elusive about the right way to think about what thinking and dwelling is, but he's very clear about what it is not. If you come to him complaining that there aren't enough houses in post-war Germany, he knows that you're wrong. He knows that whatever thinking is, it's not what you find in an editorial about homelessness, because the editorial about homelessness is focused on things rather than the understanding of being that lets things be the way, what they are. Also, the sort of thinking on display in the editorial on homelessness, that there's not enough housing stock in Dresden, maybe we should raise taxes to build more houses, is focused on calculation. What can we do, what can we do to build more houses, it impels us to ask, not what is dwelling. This you know, editorial style thinking is active means and thinking rather than deep ruminative meditative thinking. The distinction also shows up in the distinction between thinking using a means and schema and thinking which allows an essential relationship to hove into view. Thinking that takes its subject matter in the world and thinking that takes itself as a problem. Man's homeliness, not homeliness, man's homelessness <laughs> does not consist of a lack of actual houses but in a disorder of thinking. So we can imagine the way this trap that Arndt accuses Heidegger of dwelling in as a flowchart. We start with some real life problem. We're lonely. We're frightened. We worry our children will not have a livable world to grow up in. We're anxious. And this problem drives us to Heidegger. And then Heidegger then makes a sharp distinction. Either the problem is not philosophical and anything that help, helps us out of it is not deep, not real meditative thinking. And perhaps we should even feel a little ashamed or shallow to care about it. Or it is worthy of philosophical thought, in which case there's nothing we can do about it. And this is, I believe, what Arendt means when she says Heidegger mistakes his trap for a burrow. Because a burrow is a shelter we use to meet our actual needs for safety and a life for those we care about. If we have a burrow, we can extend shelter to those who have needs. But Heidegger's flowchart, if you have ontic needs, I can't help you, and if you have ontological needs, I can't help you, <laughs> means he can't help us. It's his black and white distinction between actual lack of houses and a disorder of thinking that makes it impossible to meet people who seek shelter. Heidegger is trapped because he cannot acknowledge or learn from real human need, including his own. Uh, quoting Robert Frost, uh, there are no two things as important to us in life and art as being threatened and being saved. What are ideals of form for if we aren't going to be made to fear for them. All our ingenuity is lavished on getting into danger legitimately so that we may be genuinely rescued. So anytime we find ourselves face to face with our genuine need, Heidegger shifts the register from actual problems to ontological dislocation. If we think about the actual uses of language to solve problem, problems, such as, for example, inviting a refugee family to live with us, Heidegger's division of human life into clever talk and deep receptive thinking blocks any possible move. 
Another way of looking at the issue of the trappiness of Heidegger's thought is that Heidegger associates the clever talk that rages around the world with calculated instrumental thinking and his meditative thinking with a form of receptivity or passivity. This comes out clearly when he discusses language. Man acts as though he were the shaper and master of language, while in fact language remains the mistress of man. Perhaps it is before all else, man's subversion of this relation of dominance that drives his essential being into alienation. Now there are certainly cases, definitely, where we ought to be more receptive to the wisdom that language has to offer. For example, we never should have changed the name of slacks to pants, a shortening of pantaloons, because the moment we did, we obscured the fact that slacks are the opposite of tights. <laughs> In that case, language ought to have been the mistress, and we were sassy rebels to think otherwise. But in other cases, for example, if we grow up calling an adult man boy, letting language be our mistress is very bad news. When Heidegger argues that every time we subvert that relation of domination and try to make language do something we want it to do, say, be more respective, respectful to adult men, we drive our essential being into alienation, he closes off a way of making our lives better. Heidegger is worried, of course, that instrumental rationality and glib banal talk are something like the finger trap we discussed earlier, where the harder you struggle, the worse you hurt yourself and the more you're stuck in the trap. Now, supposing that's the case, because we can certainly imagine there are cases like that, like John Elster's example, where you're trying to fall asleep, and the harder you try to fall asleep, the more sleep eludes you or you're trying to be more spontaneous, and the harder you try to be spontaneous and come up with lists of ways to be more spontaneous, <laughs> the less spontaneous you are. Well, if that were the case, then what would be the correct attitude towards getting out of the trap? Um, it wouldn't be, I would argue, ignoring the fact that it is a trap, and it wouldn't be failing to use all the means at our disposal to get out of it. It wouldn't be receptivity as opposed to activity. So, you don't need me to tell you that not everybody in this life dwells in the sense of having a fixed abode. Some people have what might, you might call an exilic phenomenology of living on the earth, constantly traveling through life, looking for safety, begging the people in this particular community to let them be there for a bit, and carrying whatever odds and ends of cultural practices from place to place that make it possible to keep low and going long enough to make a new generation that keeps on the journey. Um, in the Midrash on Lech Lecha, the Torah portion about Abraham leaving the land of idol worshippers, Rabbi Yitzchak compares Abraham to a traveler who passes a burning palace and concludes that the palace must have an owner. If you think you're in, you are in exile and faced with a burning palace, you're in a state of, of emergency from which the counsel of receptivity is not helpful. However, if we think of activity and passivity in this way, one where they are opposed and where passivity is a solution to our problem, we're in a deep trap, since if we find that the mode of life or mode of thought that we're existing in is hurting us or people we care about, we'll be impelled to either numb out or do something about it. If the thing to do about it is to realize how much trouble we get in by doing things, that is itself a thing to do. So Heidegger's advice, we're all being too active, let's try and, try and be a little more receptive, is ultimately, I think, crazy-making. Now, one could argue that there could be a person who struggles too much, and that for such a person, the idea of relaxing is, in fact, the path to freedom. It could be that in any particular instance that human thinking is in that quandary. As soon as man gives thought to his homelessness, it is a misery no longer, Heidegger claims. For this claim, we really need to check in with ourselves and see if it feels true. Is it true that once we realize what Heidegger is telling us, our lives are a misery no longer? To me, that seems very implausible. Uh, and furthermore, he doesn't give us a guide for telling we are the sort of person or in the sort of situation where our plight could be resolved by means of his thought or whether we need something else. So we can argue that the nature of the trap of Heideggerian thought is a strict separation between the actual causes of our suffering and philosophical dislocation and an unhelpful split between means and thinking and meditative thinking. None of this is to say that there could not be real costs to our over-reliance on means and thinking and our preference for domination rather than attunement or our love of glib fossil communication over a more meditative sitting with our situation. Of course, there could be, just as there could be a person who suffers from checking his phone too much, 
However, Heidegger's thought would be a trap if it, were an un, if it were equivalent to an unhelpful app for checking to see if we check our phone too much. That, in my view, is Arndt's contention. Okay, part two, Heidegger's ignorance about himself. Now let's consider the second claim that I believe Arndt makes, namely that Heidegger doesn't understand himself, which is a serious criticism of a philosopher since the whole point of philosophy is to know ourselves. Uh, but let's continue the story. Despite his incredibly extensive experience with traps, he, this is Heidegger, hit on an idea completely new and unheard of among foxes. He built a trap as his burrow. He set himself inside it, passed it off as a normal burrow, not out of cunning, but because he had always thought others' traps were their burrows, and then decided to become sly in his own way and outfit for others the trap he had built himself and that suited only him. After all, everyone knows that despite their slyness, all foxes occasionally get caught in traps. Why should a fox trap, especially one built by a fox with more experience of traps than any other, not be a match for the traps of human beings and hunters? Obviously because this trap did not reveal itself clearly enough as the trap it was. And so it occurred to our fox to decorate his trap beautifully and to hang up unequivocal signs everywhere on it that quite clearly said, come here everyone, this is a trap, the most beautiful trap in the world. From this point on, it was clear that no fox could stray into this trap by mistake. Nevertheless, many came. For this trap was our fox's burrow, and if you wanted to visit him where he was at home, you had to step into his trap. Everyone except our fox could, of course, step out of it again. It was cut literally to his own measurement. But the fox who lived in the trap said proudly, so many are visiting me in my trap that I have become the best of all foxes. And there's some truth in that too. Nobody knows the nature of traps better than one who sits in a trap his whole life long. Because Heidegger is, ignorance, is ignorant of the difference between traps and non-traps, and this has been what we've been outlining in the first part of this talk, Heidegger's distinctions don't help us get out of our problems. If we apply this to, to our discussion of building dwelling thinking, Heidegger has come up with a concept of dwelling that has made him stuck and claims it's a place to live. What makes him stuck is that it's difficult to invite others in. Heidegger doesn't realize that burrows, unlike traps, you can go in and out of, you can invite people in, you can raise a family in them. There's an element of fecundity to dwelling. In Arendt's story, Heidegger doesn't understand one of the things that makes a burrow a burrow is that you can invite people into it. He thinks that it's just a good trap. Come here, everyone. This is a trap, the most beautiful trap in the world. Now, why would people come to a trap? Arndt says, our trap was our fox's burrow. If you want to visit Heidegger, you have to go there. Heidegger doesn't understand, according to Arndt, that when he expresses his thoughts about attunement to being and the forgetting of being, this is not just a relationship between him and being and the forgetting of being. It's an expression. It's a cry for human connection. You could even say a cry for help. How do we know that? Despite whether one poses as an oracle or a priest, nobody expresses themselves for no reason. People express themselves out of a need to be acknowledged or cared for or understood. Arndt writes that Heidegger's wish to be acknowledged, Heidegger writes that what's more impelling Heidegger in his mind is a wish to be acknowledged as the best of all foxes. But as Emmanuel Levinas writes, whenever we say anything to anyone, we're laying our neediness bare and opening ourselves to a response to that neediness that we cannot understand ahead of time. Quoting Levinas, the subject in saying approaches a neighbor in expressing itself, in being expelled in the literal sense of the term, out of any locus, no longer dwelling, not stomping any ground. Saying uncovers beyond nudity what a simulation there may be under the exposedness of a skin laid bare. It's the very respiration of this sin prior to, of this skin, prior to any intention. The subject is not in itself, at home with itself, such that it would dissimulate itself or dissimulate itself in its wounds and its exile, understood as acts of undoing or exiling itself. It's bending back upon itself as a turning inside out. It's being turned to another, it's this being turned inside out. A concave without a convex. The subject of saying does not give signs, it becomes a sign, turns into an allegiance. Heidegger, I think, for Arendt, doesn't understand that by expressing his philosophy, he's becoming a sign looking for a decoder. He doesn't see that when he writes about the fourfold, he is hoping for a reader who will see the world as he sees it and make him less alone. 
He's blind to his need for human companionship or other people's wish to connect with him. That's why he ends with a brag. So many are visiting me in my trap that I have become the best of all foxes. On the surface, this is an extremely foolish brag. He's not the best of all foxes. He's dug a hole he's unable to get out of. People don't visit him because he's the best of all foxes. As Aaron says, nobody knows the nature of traps better than one who sits in a trap his whole life long. In this respect, Heidegger the fox resembles Aesop's fox who lost his tail and expects others to share his misfortune. But in another sense, he is the best of all foxes because he understands something supremely worth sharing. He just doesn't understand what it is or who he is. Uh, conclusion. So it's fair to say that Arendt is ambivalent about Heidegger. Is he the best of foxes or not? And what is it to be stuck in the trap of thinking you are in a trap? And what can we do about it? What is the difference between a trap and a burrow anyway? And while we're at it, what is dwelling and what is thinking? Um, thinking can be letting us be aware of a deep resonance to things in our life, a resonance that is only evaded by problem solving or chatting. But looking at this way, looking at life in this way can also be a trap. Thinking can also be a cry for help an effort to come out of ourselves and enter into dialogue with other human beings or other parts of ourselves. And one of the things this dialogic mode of thinking can do is help us and other people out of traps, ways of living that don't, ways of living that seem like dwelling but aren't because they don't allow fecundity or hospitality. And people can help each other out of traps. Heidegger thought he was dwelling and thinking. Arendt thought Heidegger was in a trap and although he thought he was thinking, he was actually crying for help and didn't know it. So we might be perplexed then, or I might be perplexed then, about how to answer this question. Is Arendt right about thinking, that thinking invites others to dialogue, and thus about language, and thus about dwelling, that what makes dwelling dwelling is not the fourfold by my willingness to welcome others? Or is Heidegger right, that this is all evading deeper issues in the names of some sort of misguided compassion? So. Are we picking now? Are we saying Heidegger was wrong and Arendt was right? That's not what Arendt says. She says, in a sense, he is the best of foxes, and she engages with his thought. She finds it worth thinking about. But that puts the question back a step. If Heidegger is pro-meditation and Arendt pro-dialogue, and we accept that Arendt is thinking about Heidegger in her sense, and we heed her call to think that way, aren't we picking her? And if Heidegger doesn't want to talk, and Arendt does, and Arendt gets us talking, hasn't Arendt won? And isn't winning kind of anti-dialogical? I'd have to say that we are going to have to be the answer we're seeking. Because one thing dwelling does is place images of the ancestors up. What I would think of sort of literally as photos of grandma and grandpa. And, and that's what I'm trying to do now. I'm trying to allow a dialogue or we're trying to allow a dialogue, if you're coming with me, w between Heidegger's meditative thinking and meditating on Arendt's dialogic thinking. Um, we can help them both by bringing them together, as children bring their parents together by forming a family. Heidegger leaves out of his story of dwelling the future children welcoming and hospitality. But our response need not be to exile Heidegger or Arendt we can welcome them into an imagined life together as their heirs. Uh, and I do think whenever we make peace amongst ourselves, we make peace amongst the ancestors, even if it's only in a structure we ourselves built out of thought. Thanks. Who's calling on people? B, you, you want me to do people. it? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, do you think to be human is to be uncanny? Yeah. Then a bur burrow would be a trap, right? Because a burrow would make you think that you don't have to be uncanny. And a trap even if it's a, a temporary, <laughs> even if it's a temporary burrow that you're in for a little bit to welcome people in, and then you move on. Um. Yeah, so you, so you know it's not it's not really your home. It's just your well, yeah, it's 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 your home because you can welcome other people into it for the time being to get through the storm. That, that's how I kind of look at it. But that, but you can't you can't get out of the camera. I don't think you can. No. Yeah. So so then you're you'd be 
you should just live in a trap. <laughs> well, I don't think that's right. Does that follow? <laughs> I think so, yeah. yeah I don't see. Why does it follow? Well, th because the trap is realizing that you can't have a burrow. I thought the trap was thinking that you could. <laughs> well, the, right, so the burrow, the burrow in a sense is a trap, and the trap is the place where you can be healing. It's accepting that you were never going to have a burrow. But why are you calling that a trap? Because it seems like... Um, well, well you, it's a trap because once you settle in, you lose sight of what it really is to be human, which is coming to terms with your mechanics. Yeah, I guess I feel there's a way to dwell for the time being to get through the emergency, to invite other people who also need help getting through the emergency, and then you can move on. So why, why don't you think that's what Heidegger is telling us when he's talking about that? Why, well, part of it is because I'm trying to explain what Aaron's beef is with him. But I guess I'm, I'm troubled by how... Um, how much disdain he has for people who seem to be dealing with actual real life problems. I'm troubled with the, the sharp distinction he makes between the glib author of the newspaper article about homelessness, who he's sure is glib, and what he's doing. I feel like he's, he's sort of separating himself from actual human concerns by making that move. Yeah, but... I mean, that could be right, but, but it could also be the glib writer of the editorial thinks that there's a technological solution to technology, which is itself a trap. Yeah, it could be. It could be. And, and I guess it also could not be. And what worries me is the trouble we get into if we assume that any time someone comes to us asking for help, we can easily make a distinction as to whether they're they're being glib technologists or not. That's that's what worries me. Maybe I'm overly worried. Maybe I'm a worry wart. <laughs> you are. I know. Um, Ian and Taylor. Thanks. So thanks, Eric. I, I thought that was great, and I, I love that you took on this um, this a red piece that uh, to me is like this Kafka esque, very difficult to understand. Little, little piece and gave it um, an interpretation that helped it make sense to me. So um, I'm provoked, as I mentioned to you, by some of what you said. For example, I think the idea that there's a dichotomy between the ontic and the ontological is false. Okay. Um, I think you couldn't do phenomenology if there was a, a split between the ontic and the ontological. Like the whole way to get at the say the being of art is to look at individual works of art and try and figure out by looking at works of art what what makes them art and that catches you in the circle right where you're already presupposing what it means to be a work of art in order to be able to look at particular works of art but there's not like a there's not a radical break because what you learn about the individual works is going to influence what you say about what it means to be a work of art and what you learn about what it means to be a work of art is going to reshape the way you experience particular works. So I think the very idea that there's um, a split between the ontic and the ontological or between theory and practice is Arendt's um, interpretation of Heidegger, which she very influentially put into effect in, um, when was it, Heidegger's 80th birthday, that, that memorial piece she wrote for that, where she basically, tr it was it, the most influential political apology for Heidegger, where she basically said, this is a profoundly unsophisticated guy. He didn't know anything about politics. He tried to jump into the political arena. He burned his fingers on the on the stove of politics and retreated and never mm -hmm. went back and, and retreated into just thought that had no real world application. And that would be a kind of a trap, because then if if the you know if the foxes are philosophers who are just doing this theory that's completely disconnected from practice, and Arendt is the person who knows the foxes well enough, but has refuses to call herself a fox, refuses to call herself a philosopher, even though she's I think by most considerations a great philosopher. 
you know, so but it refuses it because she has this idea that philosophy isn't political, that it that it doesn't mm -hmm. address the way um, the ideas have real world implications. That would be a trap. But I, I, although I think Heidegger's cagey about all of that in in ways that you nicely highlight, I do think he thinks that thinking has real world implications mm -hmm. and. You know, there's still lots of different, like the dialogic thing. I do think he's not, he's a profoundly undialogic thinker. He's a very solitary. So, how can you be engaged in politics if you're profoundly undialogic? Because, isn't part of politics that someone comes to you and says, We've got this problem, professor, what should we do about it? And if you're like, Well, I, I don't play that game, how are you engaged in politics? What is what you're doing? How is what you're doing even part of that game? I think for Heidegger, it's that the dialogue he's having with Kant and Hegel and Nietzsche and play, you know, the history of mm -hmm. philosophy and that he is presenting this understanding of reality as it's that stuff Taylor's going to talk about that, that shifted over time and that sort of sets these basic parameters on how we unknow, you know, sort of are taken for granted presuppositions about what things are that mm -hmm. we don't question that we just bring to things, and so he's tr by trying to get us to pay attention to and change those, he's got a view about that's going to change the world. It's a kind of a a view of so he is indulging in a sort of means end thinking. He just doesn't cop to it. He says there's some things that are wrong with how we think about the world, and we should think about it differently, and then we'll all do better. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well. And that, if that's what he's up to. <laughs> and the thought that you kind of made fun of, and it's easy to make fun of, about the, um, I wrote it down, but it's the, um, as soon as man gives thought to his homeless homelessness, it is a misery no longer. Right, that's not true, is it? Well, it's true, and there's a sense in which it's true. What's the sense? So, and I think that's what Mark was getting at. So homelessness is like your... Um, there's nothing about the nature of your being that can find a, that can, that can give you a one right way to be. So you're never going to be able to be in a, in a fixed residence in the world. Mm -hmm. There's no home that you could ever be permanently at home in, both well, metaphorically, ontologically, you know. Um, so if you're aware of that, then you um, will no longer be trapped in misery. I don't know what the German is. In English, it's nice because misery is what a miser suffers from. So if you're like the dragon hoarding all your loot and, you know, sitting on a pile of stuff that you don't share, kind of oligarchical so I, so what? I don't mean to be boneheaded about this, but, but what, what bugs me is I'm thinking, so we could live differently. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And now that we realize that we're in misery no longer, well, sure we are, because we haven't figured out a way that's better than the way we're living now. We haven't truly achieved utopia. We're, we're still miserable in countless ways that we could all we could all enumerate. Can I share a thought real quick? Yeah. Just like just let, just let me finish this up. Oh, sure. So <laughs> the um, I was just in L.A. for Christmas, and one of the things I noticed was that um, where there'd been a big homeless encamp encampment last time I was there, there were now little houses. Yeah, and I thought that was great. So I mean, on the one hand, I don't think. Heidegger would be dismissive of that, but you have, there's a question like, what does it take to change human people's <laughs> minds such that they don't treat homeless people like garbage or, or you know, an epidemic to be contained by mm -hmm. the health authorities and rather as like fellow human beings who right. deserve to, right? And I think Heidegger's working on that level, not that directly, but he, he's working on the kind of change of mind that we need to have in order for us to bring about the kind of practical changes that could allow us to live more fulfilling lives. Mm -hmm. Just um, it, directly on this point, mm -hmm. it's just a thought. Um, I don't think it's plausible that um, becoming aware of your not at home is in the world, um, like alleviates all your misery. It's a misery making sort of thing. But um, I do think there's a sense in which just the very act of making something intelligible that was hitherto unintelligible and unable to be navigated alleviates a bit of misery, right? Um, and so there's oh, that. Oh, I don't mind right? like, the a bit thesis at all. Yeah, and, <laughs> I mind the I'm, whole like, I'm thesis. thinking of like, I, I, I'm calling to mind uh, Nietzsche here, right? Like our problems in suffering is that we suffer unintelligibly. 
And at least if we have, if we have some way of making it intelligible, we can feel better. And that we can live honestly in our suffering um, because life is suffering, right? Um, or you know, human beings are uncanny or whatever it is. Um, but when Heidegger says we're homeless, he doesn't mean we're homeless, all right? That's the, he doesn't mean we don't have houses. He means there's no way in which humans could ever be finally at home. We're not the kind of creatures that could ever have a final answer about how to live. Right. But what, why does he think, or why do you think, speaking for him, that knowing that solves the problem? Why wouldn't that, why can't you, I mean, somebody, I can imagine someone who could honestly say, first step, realize that things could be radically different. Second step, let's look at proposals, let's hear what people are suffering from, what are the problems, and how good are various attempts to solve those problems. But I feel like what Arendt is complaining about is that the first step is being presented as the final step, right. when it's I not. Agree. Yeah, I agree that's her complaint, and I think she's largely right about that. I'm not dismissive of politics. I do think, you know, there's a lot of good points that you're making and that she's making. I think his idea is what's motivating a lot of the deepest misery and problems of humanity is this idea that there could be some one right way about how to live, and we mm -hmm. just have to figure that out and impose it on everybody else. And the way to deal with our own insecurity about knowing deep down that our vision of the right way to live isn't the definitive answer is to just get everyone else to do it get them to obey that it's the oh okay things. yeah well i agree that that's that's no way to run a railroad <laughs> by the way the, the german word for misery is elend which is etymologically derived from exile having been sent away from uh-huh so he thinks that exile ends once we realize um this this ontological, the truth of this ontological thesis that he's he's advocating. In his thought, so the genealogy, as you know, is probably being in time says we're all homeless. Mm -hmm. We're all in an uncanniness as an ontological condition. 42, 41, he says um, the best we can do is become at home in our not being at home. Mm -hmm. And then in the 50s, he says um, there's a kind of ontological indigeneity we can achieve. We'll mm -hmm. never have a kind of physical, geographical mm -hmm. indigeneity that's been ruled obsolete by development of the earth right but we can have a kind of we can learn to become a home and being yeah well look i don't mean to be defensive i mean i think no. that's really cool. i've got taylor on deck but i have a feeling you have a point on this issue uh yeah just just a small point so so when he says knowing this he doesn't mean you read it in heidegger and suddenly you're like oh it's not mm -hmm. miserable anymore he means you you come to terms with being uncanny and mm -hmm. the kind of exhilaration that can Right. No, I, I didn't take him to mean just cognitively, but even so, it does seem like a really strong thesis that that's sufficient to end our, our exile or our misery. I, I think it's a hyperbolic statement mm -hmm. that has to be understood. It's very like the where danger is, there is the saving power. This paradoxical sort of thing, just where you think the problem is by seeing it, you've released yourself from it a bit. It has a parallel in Freud with the undoing of neurosis, mm -hmm. when a sort of unconscious desire or feeling sort of becomes conscious, mm -hmm. you are already sort of engaged in a kind of cure, mm -hmm. or hopefully sort of at least in process of transforming. As he said, I think somewhere, the ambition of psychoanalysis is to transform neurotic misery into ordinary unhappiness. Mm -hmm. yes. It's a little bit, I, I, there's a similar structure there, but just mm -hmm. the explicit making of the problem. And when Heidegger talks about technology, you know, what's problematic about it foremost for him is that we're in its grip and we don't even know it right and we're yeah. just trying and, to and, and encourage us the sort of I mean, coming to see it point well taken that if if everything if your take on everything in your life is i just need to come up with a more clever fix yeah then that in itself oh you're stuck it's in that trap. and that's yeah. not cool yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely and so i was going to say something slightly different though which is that um so ian said this uh, Fox sort of parables, kind of Kafka-esque, and I think actually it's more like a parable or an allegory, which are supposed to lend themselves to paraphrase, as, as mm. I recall, mm -hmm. right? So in a way, it's unlike a Kafka story, which is <laughs> typical, <laughs> typical, <laughs> enigmatic, and mm -hmm. you know, really hard to interpret. And here, I think, I, I think, as I understand it, Arendt is trying to make a point that you ought to be able to sort of translate, and you were even doing it, which is to say, um, there is this thing Heidegger kept doing which is to, just as you describe it, uh, divert attention from the apparent problem to something 
philosophical, ontological, at a different register, which really requires totally reorienting the discussion. And the problem is now we're in Heidegger land, and it's his idiom, it's his style of thinking. This is the trap he's made for himself. Mm. Um, I think what she's commenting on, and I, you put it quite well, I think, uh, um, Eric, in your talk, is this sort of, yeah, something, I think, deeply apolitical about Heidegger's thinking. It's not political in the ordinary sense of being engaged, dialogical, actually thinking about plans and proposals and solutions and so on. There's something very meditative even, I think, you know, you could say sort of pejoratively solipsistic. It's like Carl Jaspers. I didn't look up that thing I told you I was going to look up. In, I think in the letter that Jaspers wrote to the denazification commission or whatever about Heidegger, it's quite damning. And one of the things he says is there's something fundamentally, as I remember it, fundamentally uncommunicative about Heidegger's thinking. I think Hannah Arendt is echoing that that comment mm -hmm. of Jaspers, mm -hmm. and I think she's right. I mean, I think uh, the fact that there's something fake political about Nazi ideology. It's pretending to be kind of practical plan proposal solutions, and what it is is a lot of propaganda and a lot of just brute violence and force. There's been this critique been made of National Socialism itself, which is there's a fakeness about the politics of it. Uh, that's typical of fascism. Um, mm -hmm. So, so in a way, well, here's what I want to propose. There's a way in which I don't think Hannah Arendt wrote this uh, as a blanket condemnation of Heidegger. I think in a way she's agreeing with something that she ascribes to Heidegger, which is that there is this difference between philosophical thinking and mm -hmm. um, the politics of the actual public square. And she's sort of, in a way, acknowledging that and saying the, the sort of tragedy or comedy of Heidegger is that he was, at, he was not himself at peace with that because he was confusing um, traps and dens. He thought he was being really political. He was proud of himself because he thought by making these oracular, deep, transcendental, or ontological claims, he could actually be a player in real politics. And in actual real politics, during his involvement with Nazism, he was a buffoon. I mean, the Nazis didn't take him seriously, precisely for this reason. And, he, and it's true that he got burned and then retreated. And in a way, I think, so my reading of this is that Arendt actually still has enormous respect and esteem for Heidegger because he's a philosopher, not because he's a particularly relevant, engagé, political intellectual mm -hmm. at all. And she embraces that part of philosophy, which is why she might be saying, look, what I'm doing is not that, because I actually have this other, and she had her own original ideas about thinking as involving this dialogical mm -hmm. component. So in a way, it's, yeah, it's a... It's a seemingly damning parable about Heidegger, but I think he ought to have embraced it. And the kind of tragedy is that he took himself way too seriously as a possible you know, man of action and player, and he never was. I mean, uh, that's, that's one way I see of reconciling these two points of view, which is to say, and I think Ian's right and Mark is right, that there's, there's a lot of subtlety in the way he thought of the relationship between meditative thinking and politics or real life problems as you say and i think he's got a fair point which is the political the engage political practical realistic kind of attitude is not the only game in town mm -hmm. there is something like reorienting our whole attunement to the world and ourselves as a way of making room for a different way of thinking about the political but i think in his best moments he's disavowing any authority to make um, as it were, first order normative or political claims and um, uh, propose policies or advocate anything. And especially, I was just rereading the Spiegel interview where he's just absolutely saying that the interviewer is trying to get him to say, so what should we do? And he says, I don't know. And that's not what I'm talking about, what I'm talking about. But what he's talking about is not just something um, totally head in the clouds abstract. It's at the level of a reattunement uh, which is going to change the way in which we can think about the political problems. But so I think in his better moments, he was distinguishing um, the two things. Mm. Uh, in his worst moments, he was getting them all conflated in a disastrous way. That's, mm. so, so I think Anna, Hannah Arendt is being really critical, but also deeply respectful. Mm -hmm. no, I agree. That wasn't a question. No.